Join me in uh, prayer. Lord, thank you that you've given us your word. Thank you that you are an awesome God, as we've said. Lord, we know that unless you work in our hearts, our hearts are hardened and opposed to you. Lord, thank you that you have shown us grace in our life. But Lord, as we know, not one of us has arrived yet. As Paul says, he strives by all means that he may somehow attain the resurrection of the dead. He hasn't made it yet. Lord, none of us have. So work in our hearts today. Even if we don't see you at work today, work invisibly. Lord, draw us together in love. Build us up in faith. Unless you build this house, we labor in vain. So work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be... I'm not this short. Is anybody that short? <laughs> We're going to be in Ephesians. You might notice a trend. We've been in Ephesians a while. But just in case, we'll do lots of review. We're in Ephesians 4 this time. We're going to talk about unity. Paul calls it the unity of faith. When I was 19, that's when Fran and I got married. And there were some people that said that that was a terrible idea. They, they warned me that marriage was hard and painful and not something anyone in their right mind would choose to do. And their assumption was, and they, they were not vague about this, they complained about it every time I saw these kinds of people. They complained that, uh, well, they just complained about their wives, really. They complained about every disagreement they had. They complained about everything their wives made them do. They essentially believed that unity wasn't even something to strive towards, but disunity, strife and discord and contention were inevitable results of marriage. In case you've never noticed, strife and contention in the Bible are sin. If you were here when we were going through Habakkuk, Habakkuk lists strife and contention as the things that he hates to have to look at and he waits for God to bring a resolution to the problem. And Paul also links these two together, strife and contention. Strife and contention and selfishness. As we look at chapter 4 in Ephesians, he's going to lay out two different walks. There's the life of unbelievers that we all once walked in. Paul includes himself, even as a Jew. The new life in Christ is so amazing that uh, he might as well have been a sinner and a Gentile beforehand. There's the walk of the Gentiles that we once lived in, and there's the walk that's worthy of the calling we've received in Christ. One of those walks involves unity and love, and the other walk involves strife and discord and selfishness. I hope that none of you have the wrong idea in your head that I believe is somewhere down the line a lie straight from Satan that discord and disunity and anger are unavoidable results of marriage. Because if you can't have unity in your marriage, that's the person you're closest to in your life, if there's no unity there, how could you even have hope that we could have unity as a church, as a local church, never mind the global church? If there's no unity in the smallest unit, the bigger unity is just a bunch of disunited people disuniting. So, we'll look at this. The, the, first, the first time I ever did Sunday school downstairs with the kids, I told them, when you have a question, there's two ways you can answer it. There's a right way and a wrong way. The wrong way is as you're reading, you come across a verse and you, it doesn't make sense, and so you ask a hard question. And then to answer it, you just stop looking and go, hmm, hmm, that's a good question. And then you think about it in your head. The right way would be to read the rest of the Bible and look for the answer. Because the answer is not in your head, it's in the Bible. <laughs> Unity is a question that for years, I, I chose the wrong way to answer the question. I thought, two questions. What, what is unity? Second, uh, where does unity come from? I imagined for myself that, well, unity must be when we all agree on everything. And it must come from me being really nitpicky. I didn't get that from the text. I got that from my head. So let's look at the text. Ephesians chapter 4. 
I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. We'll stop there for now. He's mentioning a bunch of one things, one Lord, one spirit, one baptism. There's two ways Paul's going to approach this question of unity. One, he's alluding back to things he's already said. That in Christ, we are made one. He's speaking specifically of Jew and Gentile because he's writing to a church where there's Jews who spent their whole lives growing up um, believing they were close to God, which they were compared to the Gentiles, and Gentiles who didn't know anything about God at all. And now they've been made one people, sharing the same promises, worshiping the same God, and they've both been exalted with Christ to the heavenly places to the point where their differences mean nothing. They're made one. They're united. And this is one of the ways Paul does it. And this is why he emphasizes one body, one spirit, one faith, one baptism. We're all given the same salvation by the same God through the same Jesus. We all have faith in the same gospel. So even if you were Jews and Gentiles who you might know did not get along, they had wars constantly before and after Paul wrote this. The Jews and Romans just slaughtered each other. But even despite their many differences, they were made one people because of what Christ accomplished at the cross, giving us all the same salvation, saving us all from the same sin nature that was in each of us. The Jews weren't saved from their sin nature before Jesus came, and neither were the Gentiles, because like Kelsey was saying, the law didn't save you from that. But Jesus came to save them from all the things the law couldn't save them from. And then he saved Gentiles on top of that. They're made one people. And in this sense, each one of us is already made one people. We already have unity. But it doesn't always look like we have unity, does it? These days especially. I, I have not, I think if you ask most unbelievers, hey, you think the church is united? Or even believers. Most people aren't going to give you a yes as an answer. Oh yeah, totally united. Why? I've never heard Christians disagree about anything. I doubt it. And so Paul has a second answer. Oh, we're going to skip ahead for now to... Um, yeah, no, we won't. We won't skip ahead. In the center of, these two, of everything he's going to say in this chapter is this next verse, verse 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. So up to this point, he's explained, this is what you should do to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. In verse 17, he's going to say, this is the walk you shouldn't walk in. Get out of that old walk you were in and walk this, in this new way. But in the middle of that, He's got some theology. Turn with me to Psalm 68. Let's see where, where he's coming from. Because he's quoting Psalm 68. That's why it looks like a separate paragraph in many of your Bibles. Or maybe it's boldened. Maybe it's italicized. Whatever the case. Maybe they gave you no indication. They're just really hoping you know your Bible. Psalm 68. You might remember from uh, the last few times that we've been in Ephesians. Ephesians emphasizes very much God's might. In uh, Ephesians 1, at the very end, it says, He put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We've talked about how putting something under your feet is uh, warrior imagery. God sent in Joshua to go into the land and tread the enemies. David put his enemies under his feet. It was this idea of rule. Psalm 68 is a psalm about God as a warrior and God as a ruler. Psalm 68, verse 1. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so you shall drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so the wicked perish before God. You should have in your mind... What in the world does this have to do with unity? We'll get there. God's a warrior. But the righteous shall be glad. They shall exalt before God. They shall be jubilant with joy. 
Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord. Exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of the widows is God in his holy mountain. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, O God, you shed abroad. We'll, we'll go ahead a bit to um, verse 11. The Lord gives the word. The woman who announced the news are a great host. The kings of the armies, they flee, they flee. The women at home divide the spoil. Though you men lie among the sheepfolds. So the imagery here is God goes out to war. He defeats all the enemies and he brings back the spoils of war. Ta beats them up and takes all their stuff. When you get to verse 18, it's that same imagery going on. Uh, I'll start in 17. The chariots of God are twice 10,000. Thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord may dwell there. This is the verse Paul quotes. It's a verse about how God goes out to battle, beats up the enemies, and brings back all the gold. He receives gifts. Notice that in Ephesians, did it say receives? It said uh, gives. Some people have a real problem with this. How can it says receives? The idea is he goes out and he takes the stuff from the enemies, even among the rebellious. And Paul says he gives. Maybe it's obvious. In uh, verse, we read this already. Verse 12, it says, The kings of the armies, they flee, they flee. The women at home divide the spoil. The idea is God goes out to war. He brings back the uh, plunder. Swiftly, you might imagine. This is all from Isaiah too. Marshal Ashbaz. And then he gives it to his people. For Paul... He sees this as a picture of what Jesus does. He says, what does it mean that he ascended? This is back in Ephesians 4. What does it mean that he ascended, but that he also descended to the lower regions of the earth, or the lower regions, namely the earth, depending on your translation. Give me a second as I find Ephesians. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. If you were a Jew living in this time, you might object. How can, you, you say Jesus is God, you say Jesus ascended. How does that work? Isn't God already the most exalted person in the universe? How could he possibly ascend any higher than he already is? And yet you say Jesus ascended? Well, what does it mean that he ascended, but that he also descended? And Paul points out, God descended in the Old Testament. He marched from Sinai. He came, he came down and went to battle. And so what could he mean for God to ascend except that he also descended? And Jesus is God. God, coming, God has in the past come down and brought salvation. We've talked about, a bit about the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is all about going up and down. Israel goes up and down quite a bit. You shall go down to a land and then I'll bring you up again. God reminds them of it in their food laws. The locusts have bent legs because they go up and down. You only eat animals that chew the cud. The word for chew cud is actually they br it goes down and they bring it up. To remind them that God brought them down to Egypt and he brought them up. He brought them down into the Red Sea and he brought them up. And so, you know Jesus, he's got to outdo everyone. He went further down and further up than anybody ever had before. <laughs> Picking up on the concepts of both Israel and God in the Old Testament to be the ultimate savior. But for Paul, this leads to humility. Why? Jesus came for battle. He defeated death on the cross. What is the plunder? It's you and me. We are plunder. We're, we can't boast. You can't say, oh, I'm saved because I'm so awesome. I heard the gospel, and then by my own brilliance, I realized that I, and then by my own innate strength, 
I've lived the Christian life. No, it's all God, every step of the way. And Paul sees it as, you are the plunder of the kingdom of darkness. Go back to chapter 2. He says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We were the kingdom of darkness. Jesus came. He beat up the kingdom of darkness, and we're what he took out to give as gifts, spoils of war. Paul says he, he explains the gifts that he gives. Verse 11 of chapter 4. And he gave, that's the word gave from verse 8. He's interpreting the psalm. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. If you've ever received good teaching in your life, you know, God brought Arnie here. He could have brought Arnie anywhere. It's a gift from God. It says he gave gifts to men. It doesn't say he gave gifts generally to mankind. He gave gifts to men. Each one of us has received people in our life that God plundered from the kingdom of darkness as a gift to you for your benefit so that you could be built up. If you yourself are plunder, how can we boast if we're plunder? For Paul, humility and unity are linked. When we have humility, when we realize, you know, the church isn't, Jesus says it like this, the Gentiles lord it over one another, but the one who'd be greatest among you must make himself a servant. When we live in this humility where we serve one another, when we realize we're all plunder, we were all sinners until Jesus saved each and every one of us. If you know that Jesus didn't need to save you, and yet he continues to be gracious towards you, how can you do anything but be gracious to others? And when you know that Jesus died for others, how can you be anything but kind and gracious towards the ones you know Jesus died for? For Paul, this passage explains how we come to unity. And he says it in verse 13. Uh, until we attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of God, or the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. Notice the way that's worded. The unity of faith and of. Unity is of two things. This is two things that unity comes from. Unity comes from faith. This passage isn't going to bring you any unity if you don't believe it. Faith and believe, by the way, are the same word in Greek. Pistis and pistuo. They're the same word in Hebrew, too. It's only by faith that this truth about God will bring you to unity or will cause humility. And it's the knowledge of the Son of God. The more you know about Jesus, the more you'll have unity. The more you know his kindness, his love, that he gave up everything. Become, he became a human forever to be with us that he put up with a whole lot of nonsense at the cross for us. The more you know that, the more you'll have unity. I don't mean this in some generic way. I, I think it was John Piper. Somebody asked him, what was the best marriage advice you could possibly give? And he was like, love God more. Read the Bible. Because <laughs> the more you know Christ, the more you'll be brought together. Let's move on. Uh, verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by deceitfulness and crafty schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which is it equipped, that's a way of talking about unity, joined together, when each part is working properly, makes the whole body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I said there were two ways Paul talks about unity here. The first is that God has accomplished unity through Christ at the cross. He's made us one people. We were once afar, but we have been brought near. 
one body, one Lord. The other way is we grow together as a body. We build one another up. We come closer to God, and as we do that, we come closer to one another. John says it like this. We have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. They're tied together. From whom the whole body, verse 16 again, joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped. When each part is working properly, the parts are us, by the way, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. When we walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called, when we walk in humility and gentleness, when we're patient, when we bear with one another in love, when we speak the truth in love and build each other up, the whole body grows together. Continuing, verse 17. He's now going to explain what we used to be like. And this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given them up to, have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Notice the way he says this, to put off your old self and to be renewed. That's a continuing thing. Paul doesn't conceive of this as when you were saved, your old self disappeared forever and you never had to deal with it again in any sense whatsoever. I mean, I wish that's how it was sometimes. Don't you wish your every sinful desire in your being was just eradicated the moment you became a Christian? But we were taught by Christ to put off the old self. And Paul assumes that everyone reading this and everyone hearing it, because back then they would have just actually had one person read it. They didn't all know how to read. But everyone hearing his letter had an old self. Every one of us still deals with sin. There's no one who's fully uh, got rid of it somehow. There's people who think they have. The Pharisees seem to think they have. They're deluding themselves. If anyone says he has no sin, he makes God a liar. Paul assumes that we have this old self that used to control us and rule us. It rules us no longer. But this callousness, this... Um, all that's... Our sin nature in us that's still there is not going to lead you to unity. Unity is not the natural state. It's not the natural state of a church. It's not the natural state of a marriage. It's not the natural state of anything. Unity comes when we submit to Christ, when we have faith in him. Naturally, we're children of nature by wrath. No, children of wrath by nature. <laughs> we're children of wrath by nature. And that's still, that nature is still here. We still have to deal with it. So he says, therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no, this next verse is important, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. That sounds hard. This is how we build one another up. We speak the truth in love. You see someone in, a, in sin, you pray for them, they, you see them never ever come over it, you confront them. Speak the truth in love. The truth is that Christ died for them. Speak the truth in love. The cru truth is that we were sinners. We have no right to boast. Speak the truth in love. And don't speak anything that doesn't accomplish that goal. Jesus says we judge for every idle word. Now you might read that and think, oh my, I'm pretty sure Paul only put this in here for super Christians. Everyone else can just like 
their words don't matter, we can all just say whatever we want, I don't want to have to think about my decisions that hard. Read the next verse. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And in case you thought he was maybe starting a new thought, unrelated, he goes immediately back to the previous thought. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. See how he puts that right in the middle? Be kind. Make sure every word you say is useful, spoken in love, truthful. And don't grieve the Spirit of God. Our, if we are harsh with our words, if we're selfish in what we say, if I get up here in front of you and I speak, uh, and my goal is to make myself look smart instead of to help you see how amazing Christ is, that'd be pretty easy to do. I could throw out some more Greek and Hebrew than anyone could ever remember. And, you know, I'd be grieving the Spirit of God. If our goal is to slander, if our goal is to defame, or nowadays you see it all the time on the internet, but some of my best friends can get stuck in this where we just want to mock people for being wrong. It doesn't do them any good. It doesn't do us any good. It doesn't do anybody any good. But oh man, don't you think they're funny how wrong those people are? And we grieve the Spirit of God with our harshness by not being kind, by not being forgiving the way God in Christ forgave us. We act as though we haven't been forgiven. We forget that we were sinners. We forget that we're plunder in God's victory. I've been doing a chapter every time. I don't know if you picked up on that pattern. I'm actually going to end on verse 1 of chapter 5 today. Because it can, chapter numbers are arbitrary sometimes. And he really summarizes in this next verse. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. God in Christ forgave you. God hasn't been harsh with you. He could be harsh with you. He says in Psalm 130, iniquity abounds forever. Lord, if you should mark, who could stand? Meaning, every one of us has so much sin that if God was to hold you accountable for all of them, if God was even to show you all of them, who could stand? But he goes on. But with you there is infinite forgiveness with the result that you are feared. God is forgiving. So let us also be kind-hearted, forgive one another, be united together in our goal to build one another up in love. Don't get sidetracked by whatever goal, personal goals we might think we have. Oh, I want to prove that, uh, you know, Trudeau's annoying. Yeah. That's not going to build up the kingdom. I want to prove that uh, Calvinism is blah, 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 whatever. Build up the church in love. We are the church. Build up one another. Build up your spouses. Build up your kids. Let the peace of God reign in our hearts. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you have purchased our unity at the cross, that you have made us one people, sharers, partakers of the same promise. Lord, you have given us the same spirit of redemption as a seal, the inheritance that you have stored up for us, unfading and imperishable. Lord, we don't deserve it. And nothing we've done since you saved us has made us any worthier. Lord, we still all stumble in many ways. We know that if anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, he's a perfect person, able to control also the rest of the body. But Lord, none of us has made it. You know our hearts. You know our sins. And you, yet you've given us a desire to serve you. So increase that desire, Lord, as you work in us to will, work in us also to do unto your good pleasure, Lord. Be glorified in us. In Jesus' name, amen.